We thank you, Father, for this time. What a privilege we have to be able to gather freely and to worship you and to hear your word preached without fear of someone coming in and, and stopping this. Lord, we are so thankful for the sacrifice of those who have laid down their lives to make this country what it is. We're so thankful for the freedom that you offer us in Christ, not just a, an earthly freedom, but eternal freedom. And I pray today, God, as we open your word, as we hear what you have to say to us, that you would bring that kingdom and that freedom into the hearts and lives of these people sitting here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in the gospel of Mark as a church. Mark is part of the one big story that we call the Bible. The Bible is this one big story of God's plan to rescue humans from sin, to redeem humanity, to restore what is broken for his glory and for our good. And so as we continue in this story, which I, I think Mark is probably like the, one of the climax moments in this story, it's Jesus. But we're going to continue in Mark chapter 2, if you would turn in your Bibles to there. And the page number for Mark 2 for the Bibles in the seat backs in front of you will be up on the screen here. And you're welcome to use those Bibles. But one thing that struck me as you're turning there, when I was studying this week, I realized as I was kind of going back over Mark chapter 1, we're not even that far into Mark, but I realized that the further we get into Mark, the closer and closer Jesus gets to sickness and sin. The closer he gets, and the closer he gets, by the way, the madder the scribes get, right? It's kind of this opposite progression. And you, and you might think, this, this is surprising because Jesus came, and when he came, he was baptized, and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove, and the Father said, oh, this is my beloved Son, I'm so well pleased in him. And if you were to stop the story there and not know what happened after, but just could only guess, I think... A good guess would be after that moment of divine approval and appointment, Jesus would then be taken into a beautiful throne room where people would wait on him and bring him grapes and water bottles and well, I don't know, what, what is it you bring kings and stuff? But anyway, that would be very expected. But after this moment of, of, of approval, I love you, I'm so pleased with you, Jesus, what? Goes off into the desert for 40 days with no food. And you're thinking, wait a second, why did he come? And then when he comes back, he still doesn't say, okay, now I've, put, I've paid my dues, I'm going to go sit in the throne. No, when he comes back, he starts touching sick people who nobody will touch. And he starts healing them. And you see even in this a progression. You see Jesus, first of all, you know, healing Simon's mother-in-law of a fever. And you think, wow, that, that cool Jesus, you know? Maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe not. I know, but that's awesome. It's not, but you'll see where I'm going. And then in the next episode, Jesus touches a man full of leprosy, which you just did not do, was not a smart thing to do. Otherwise, you get leprosy. Jesus touches him. Imagine the people. Like, what? They're shocked. There's this progression, Jesus getting closer and closer to sickness. But we see the same thing with, with sin and spiritual stuff. Jesus is in the synagogue, and he casts out a demon out of this possessed man. But then what did we find last week? With the paralytic man, Jesus forgives all his sins. Every wrong thing he's ever done, every bad thought he's ever thought, Jesus totally wipes the slate clean. And the scribes are like, hold on. Like, we could deal with the demon being cast out, but now you're, now you're acting like God. <laughs> so you see this closeness. Jesus is getting more and more into the brokenness of our humanity. And just when you think it couldn't get any more dramatic than all of your sins are forgiven, which by the way, this is kind of what I picture. I picture still some distance. Jesus maybe waving his hand, son, your sins are forgiven. You think, wow, how, how, how great, how intimate. But this week it actually gets even closer where Jesus is not just dealing with sins from a distance. He is interacting with and spending time with sinners. Sinners, And so with that, read with me in Mark chapter 2, verse 13. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him. Now just very quickly, look back at verse 12. How does verse 12 end? 
We've never seen anything like this. This is amazing. And so it makes very good sense that if Jesus left and went by the sea, the crowd is just like flocking behind him. They love it. They want more. So the crowd is coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So we'll stop this morning right there, but again we see this progression. Jesus is getting closer and closer to broken humanity, and as he gets closer and closer, we see more and more of his reason for coming to earth. More and more of his purpose and his identity as he gets closer and closer. And it says he went out by the sea. Now, we've already been out by the sea in Mark chapter 1. What did he do out by the sea? Called the first four disciples, right? Andrew and Simon and James and John. That's where he was, out by the sea. And so he's back there, and it says the crowd is coming to him, and what is he doing? Again, teaching them. Now last week, I I spent some time, we spent some time on talking about how Jesus prioritized preaching. You always think of Jesus, and maybe the world would think of Jesus as, you know, hey, he was doing healing and making the lame walk and causing the blind to see, and that is all so true. But he prioritized preaching, and who can remember why from last week? Why did Jesus lead with preaching? I'll just give you one verse by way of review from last week. Romans 10, 17 says this, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now that makes total sense, meaning that unless we hear Jesus speak, there will be no faith that rises up in us to say, oh, Jesus can do what he just said he can do. And if there is no faith, there is no salvation and there is no transformation. And so that is why Jesus leads with preaching. He is trying at every moment to get God's word out to people so there can be faith. But something jumped out at me from these verses this week. I was ready to move right past, but I noticed something. Jesus has already been preaching in Mark. We've already seen this, but this is the first time Jesus is, who notices the difference? Teaching. Now you may think, tomato, tomato, right? Preaching, though, that word, that Greek word means to proclaim, to declare. It's almost like you just stand up, you do your thing, and you sit down, and you move on, and everybody's just got to deal with it, (laughs) Teaching, that Greek word, means to explain something, to expound on something, to to preach it, but then to say, now now let me talk to you about what this means for you. And what does this tell us about Jesus, that he is preaching, but he is also teaching? It tells us that he had intentional times where he interacted with people face to face. He was close to them. He explained what he said. He walked through what it meant for them. And I love that, by the way. And I don't know if you've noticed, but reading the Bible, I hope you've had this experience, but when you read the Bible, by the way, this is why we do this time. This is why we we have preaching. This is why we open up our Bibles is because Jesus is still speaking to us. Amen? Do you believe that? Yes. He's still speaking to us. And, And you may or may not have noticed the preaching and the teaching character of Jesus in your Bible reading. For example, sometimes you're reading and you have a preaching moment from Jesus. He's like, boom, that is true. Something is declared to you and you go, oh, yeah. But then there's a lot of times where you're reading and your eyes are opened in a way that they weren't before. And you understand something progressively as you didn't before. And and you see how it applies to you all of a sudden. Raise your hand if you've experienced that. Yeah, that's Jesus himself, the living word of God preaching and teaching and applying his word to our lives. I love that. But he's teaching, and he, he passes by this man named Levi. Levi's sitting in his tax booth, and he says to Levi, follow me, and he gets up and follows him. Now, Levi 
You may or may not know, Levi is also referred to as Matthew, and who can tell me one thing about Matthew, biblically? Tax collector and the writer of the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. But Levi and Matthew, just so you're not confused the entire rest of the time, are not two separate people. It's the same guy. Levi is the Jewish name, the Hebrew name, for, uh, and Matthew is the Greek name. So you think, well, why was Levi, why was Matthew? Well, you're going to find out in a second, but Matthew was the Greek name because he was employed by the Romans as a tax collector. Levi was his Jewish name because he collected taxes from the Jews. So his name was probably used interchangeably throughout. But this is Levi. We'll try to use Levi throughout here since this is what my translation says. But we're going to look at him in a minute. But I want you just to notice, first of all, something about Jesus that at least was profound to me, hopefully is meaningful to you. Jesus had access to the crowds. He was a celebrity. That's maybe the easiest way to put it. People followed him around. They hung on every word. They probably would have done anything that he said to do. And this is what most people in our culture, in our humanity, would consider the dream life. You see this in the world, don't you? All I want is a crowd following me. The more people that know me and love me, the better. And I kind of don't care who they all are as long as my number's growing. I'm serious, right? We laugh, but you're like, Instagram, I just broke a thousand, you know, followers. It's about the number. It's about the crowd. And Jesus has the crowd. He doesn't have to stop. He just has to wait for people to come to him. But notice something very profound here. Jesus has access to the crowds, but his attention is always on the individuals. He's looking at individual people because he didn't come for the crowd. He came for the people. You know, I, I was thinking actually between services when I first met Jesus. I grew up in the crowd. Hearing about Jesus. I, I refer to it as the Christian airport. <laughs> where there were postcards of Jesus and there were signs pointing to Jesus, but it was still just an airport. I was in the crowd, but then the day Jesus showed himself to me, I felt like I was the only person in the world. He saw me. He called me. Jesus sees individuals, and you've seen that throughout Mark. You see Jesus stopping his sermon for a man in the synagogue. You see Jesus going out by the sea and calling, Andrew, Simon, James, John, follow me. Jesus goes into Simon's mother-in-law and, and heals her, this sort of obscure character in the grand picture of things. He touches the leper. He heals the paralytic, who, by the way, struck me this week, were identified by their illness. They were known. That was their identity. So you're talking about, hey, you know that guy down the street? I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah, yeah, the leper. That's who they were, and Jesus saw them, and he talked to them, and he valued them, and he touched them, even with all of these crowds following him around. And by the way, I just rattled through those list of people, the paralytic and the leper. Do you notice a pattern about the kind of people Jesus is pursuing? What kind of people is Jesus pursuing? Outcasts of society, sinners, people that nobody really cares or notices about. And he passes by another one named Levi. And he says, Levi, follow me. And, and Levi gets up and he follows him. Now, what is Levi's profession? Go ahead and say it. Tax collector, yeah, it's very obvious, it's right there. But Jesus, uh, Levi's a tax collector, and I want you now, if you're keeping track of Jesus' inner circle, if you're keeping track of his core team that Jesus, the Son of God, is putting together in his mind and he's executing perfectly, because he's Jesus, who is on his team so far? Fishermen. Four fishermen on his let's go save the world team, Okay. And so you're probably thinking, okay, maybe not an overly strong start to a good, solid religious team. But Jesus, if I had any advice for you, I would say now is when you start building some strength into your team. <laughs> How about a mentor for these uneducated fishermen? Somebody with some moral reputability. Is that what he does? Now, I, I think he now here he actually takes a step further back with a tax collector. Now, you may not know, but I'll just say a few things about tax collectors in these days. These were people who obviously collected taxes, but these were also um, employees of the Roman government. 
So immediately, all of the Jews viewed them as traitors because they worked for the enemy. They were traitors. And the way that you would get a tax collecting job is the Roman government would uh, put out, basically open up a contract for a tax collecting spot. And the highest bidder got the contract. They would literally put that job to an auction and people would bid and whoever had the most money won that job. Talk about like corruption. But I was thinking about that this week. Based on how tax collectors were seen in society, the question is why in the world would you even want that job? The answer, I'll tell you, is because they worked for the Roman government and because they had the Roman government and the authority of the government at their back, they could charge whatever they wanted. And they did. They marked up the prices. They basically could, you know, double it and say, this is what is due. And if they didn't pay, the Roman soldiers got involved. But they would take that money, they would pocket their part, whatever it was, and then they would pay the taxes to the Roman government. And so it is not hard to imagine they were hated, not just by the Jews as traitors, but by all the people. So much so that when people got this job tax collector, I read this in a, like a, a history book this last week, they were immediately excommunicated from the synagogue. Translation, you can no longer go to church. You're not allowed even in the door if you're a tax collector. Another thing is when you got this job, you were immediately disqualified from serving as a witness in court because you were no longer trustworthy. We couldn't trust you. So this is what this reputation. Nobody really liked him. And you see this in the New Testament in the fact that they are grouped often with other unreputable titles. Eight times in the Gospels you see the, the, the phrase tax collectors and sinners. Several times you also see the phrase tax collectors and prostitutes. It's like they're, there's one and the same. You might as well just keep them all together. That is how they were viewed. And I was actually wondering this week, trying to think, oh, what would be a modern-day equivalent of this? I actually had an IRS person come up to me after the first service and say, I honestly think it's the IRS. <laughs> and she was dead serious. She's like, I think people hate the IRS. We'll save that for another time, but growing up for me, all of the pastors that I grew up under always taught that it was like a garbage collector. Anybody? No? Me? Yeah. And then as soon as I thought that this week, I'm like, wait a second. I love my garbage collector. He collects my garbage. He takes away my garbage. And if I go outside, he waves at me. And if I'm, if I'm running late, maybe he slows down. And if I'm, you know, careening recklessly down the driveway, anybody? Because it's coming, you hear it coming and you haven't got it out yet. He, he slows down and he gets it. But now, I guess, to tweak the image a little, imagine that every time he came by, he stole out of your car. And he doubled the price of garbage services and put half in his pocket. Maybe. Maybe that's it. Okay. I don't know. But the point is not that. The point is that Jesus chooses, purposely chooses, one of these people for his inner circle. A tax collector, Levi. And you remember the first time Jesus chose the first guys, the, the, the fishermen? Very shortly after, he ends up in one of their homes. He's in Simon's house with Simon's friends and his family and probably learning about his favorite food and his hobbies. This is Jesus. And that is why you see him doing the exact same thing here. Jesus calls Levi, and along with Levi comes all of Levi's friends. And so he is uh, over at Levi's house because Levi throws a feast for Jesus, or just throws a feast. Actually, historians would say that this was Levi's sort of goodbye feast from the profession. Because you think about it, the, the disciples who left their boats went back to their boats. You actually read that in John 21. They went back fishing. They, it's not like they walked away and their boats floated off. They could go back. Not Matthew, not Levi. Le Levi left his tax collecting business and there were probably 50 people waiting in line for the contract. It was gone, he's done, he's moving on, but he has this party where he invites all of his friends to come and be with Jesus. And it says this in verse 15, if you're open there still. As he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples for there were many who followed him. I thought this week, why would Jesus choose 
someone as his follower, as his inner core team that society despised? Why would he choose someone who had very little ability to go reach the Jews, for example? I think the answer is because, yes, there were many who hated Levi and all of his friends, but, but there were many who loved Levi. And who were those people? <laughs> Tax collectors and sinners and people like Levi. So you notice in a moment, Jesus calls Levi and he immediately has intimate firsthand access to all of his friends. Otherwise would not have had, right? So he calls Levi and he's in this house and, and we learn something so profound in this verse, I think. The reason there were so many tax collectors and sinners at this party, I don't think it's because Levi threw a great party necessarily because he had really well-designed invitations. <laughs> the reason we see right in this verse is because there were many of them who followed Jesus. Think about that for a second. Sinners liked Jesus. People that society looked down upon and ignored and alienated, they loved Jesus. And the question is why? Why did they love being around Jesus? Is it because Jesus said, it doesn't matter how you live? It doesn't matter what you believe? Is that it? No. In fact, when Jesus first came to earth on the scene and began ministering, what was the first thing he said? In a word, repent. In other words, leave your sin behind. Don't keep doing that. Come follow me. And so the question is, why in the world would sinners want to be around somebody who preached repent? I think the answer is very simple, but again, very profound. I think the answer is that Jesus loved them. Jesus loved them. He looked at them, which by the way, don't underestimate the power of that. Everybody else, the whole crowd following Jesus, there's, there's Levi at his tax booth. I guarantee they all did this. You're a nobody. You just keep doing your dirty thing over there at your tax booth. You're nobody to me. And what did Jesus do? He looked at him. And he said his name. Wait, wait, you know who I am? You mean I have value? <laughs> Jesus loved them. He appreciated who they were. He did not put off the vibe that he was better than people. He knew more than people. He didn't sin as much as people, which by the way, all of those are true. He was better. He did know more. He never sinned once, and yet the secret was in the fact that he treated people the way every one of us wants to be treated. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, gay or straight, and I say that, I know that is hot in our, in our culture, but I'm saying it on purpose because this is serious. Jesus didn't come along and say it doesn't matter what you do. He didn't say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, all roads lead to God. Never. But what he did so well was recognize and appreciate the intrinsic value of every human. He looked at people and he loved them and they knew it, right? That's why they hung out with him. That is the best test, by the way, of whether or not really, you really love somebody is ask them. I had a guy come up after the first service and say, Micah, do I love you? Ask them, not just because I've said I love you, not just because in theory I love you. Do you feel loved by me? Do you feel valued? Do you feel cherished? That's a scary question. Try it with your spouse this afternoon if you have one. But Jesus loved them and they knew he loved them. And now, when we think we could just sit back and enjoy this beautiful scene of the Son of God who could have isolated himself from the filth get, gets in the middle of it. He's eating with them. He's listening to their dirty jokes. All of it. He's there with them. He's part. He's, he's, he's loving them well. And if we could just enjoy that, but we can't. Who has a problem with what's going on? Surprise, surprise the religious leaders, the people who love people in theory, the people who are there on earth with the profession of leading people to God in theory. Jesus is actually doing it. He is living out the will of God. They just talk about the will of God. But they're mad that Jesus is there with these people. 
And it occurred to me this week, something very ironic. The leaders were mad at Jesus when he said, all of your sins are forgiven to the man. Why were they mad? Because he's acting too much like God. <laughs> now why are they mad at him here? He's acting too little like God. He's too much like a sinner. So you just, the guy can't win. But verse 16, look at it. The scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat? Why does he eat with these people? And the disciples, I don't know if they were stumped or what, but Jesus answers. He jumps in and he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. What Jesus is saying is here is, I didn't come to hang with people who have it all together or think they have it all together. And that is a very important distinction here because Jesus isn't saying, you guys aren't sick. You guys don't need me as bad as these people need me. You guys don't sin as much as these people sin. He's not saying that. In fact, Jesus called the Pharisees out on their sin all the time for their hypocrisy and their pride and their legalism and their lust for power. What Jesus is saying is this. I came for those who are sick and who know they're sick. Those are the people I came for. I came for the people who need me. I came for the people who want me, for the people who will invite me into their home, into their life, and say, Jesus, tell me more. I need more. I need more of what you're saying. Can I hear more? And he responded every single time. People who knew they were sick. And the point he's making, friends, this is so important. If you don't know you're sick, Jesus can't help you. If you don't know you're sick, he can't help you. Imagine being at the doctor's office and somebody's sick, but they don't want to believe it, and the doctor's trying to convince them. How much help can that doctor be to that person? None at all. Until they say, okay, I'm ready for whatever it is you have to give me. So Jesus is spending time with people who know they need him, and rather than being moved by this beautiful sin, the Pharisees are mad. Because in their minds, in their reasoning, anyone who is righteous avoids these kinds of people. The more righteous you get, the more you avoid these kind of people. And that mentality, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, is built into the name Pharisee. The name Pharisee. By the way, this is the first time Mark introduces this term, Pharisee. So far we've been meeting the scribes and seeing the scribes, but here he says the scribes of the Pharisees. They're of this religious group called the Pharisees. And remember last week I said Mark always includes what he includes on purpose. There's nothing there that's just there by accident. Why does Mark at this point in, include the word Pharisee? The answer is that the word Pharisee means to separate. This was their identity. This was what their pride was wrapped up in. We stay away from those people. We avoid those people. And Jesus is doing exactly the opposite, which is why they're like, there's no way Jesus can be the son of God. <laughs> but on Jesus' perspective, he's saying, no, but I, I love those people. And I came to influence those people. And how in the world am I going to influence them from a distance? That's a good question for us as Christians. How do I love someone and they know I love them if I'm separated from them? If I look the other way when I walk past them? It's impossible. And Jesus knows that, and he's saying, I came for these people. You know, a great example of this in Luke is Luke chapter 7. And a Pharisee invites Jesus over to his house for dinner. Now, I want to be very clear here. Jesus didn't play favorites. Jesus wasn't like, ah, the tax collectors and sinners are my people. I can't stand the Pharisees. Never. Never said that. Jesus came for anyone who felt their need for him. And so, for example, Nicodemus. John 3, he was a religious leader, and he said, Jesus, tell me more. And what did Jesus do? He engaged with Nicodemus. He shared the gospel with Nicodemus. He doesn't care if you're a Pharisee or a prostitute, any of that. He just wants people who know they need him. And so this Pharisee invites Jesus over for dinner, and Jesus goes to his house for dinner. And I imagine the different environment of Levi's house and the Pharisee's house. But he's over at dinner, and he's at the table with this Pharisee and all of his Pharisee friends. And this woman walks in the house who is known as a sinner in the city. And she comes up to him and she starts washing Jesus' feet with her hair. 
and her tears. Why tears? Because of how much Jesus has loved her. And she has felt so valued by Jesus, and she loves him so much she just took a risk and broke into a Pharisee's house to love him more and to wash his feet and clean him off with her hair and get all of the dirt that was on his feet on her hair. And this beautiful moment and the Pharisee who invites Jesus over says what? Verse 39, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. You notice the contrast in these verses? This is their mentality. You have to stay away from these people. And this is such a powerful display in Luke chapter 7 that the Pharisees accuse Jesus not just of eating with sinners, but they call him what? A friend of sinners. They, they one up it. And so I want to make two quick observations on these verses this morning. The first is that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Now this is obvious, but it is profound because as hard as we can be on Pharisees, oh, those Pharisees, they're so terrible, their response represents the default human response. And that is this. It says this. Those people aren't like me. Those people don't look like me. Those people don't act like me. In fact, those people, if I'm going to be honest, make me uncomfortable. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull back and isolate myself from those people. And I'm going to gather around myself people who make me feel comfortable. Right? I'm going to gather around people who make me feel good about myself. So that I can be valued. And it's not, it's not evil. It's just human. It's natural. And so that is what these Pharisees are doing. And that is the mentality Jesus is a friend of sinners, though. He is coming with the heart of God, saying, I came to be close to all people, to love all people no matter what. No matter what. Back when God made that first promise to Abram, do you remember Genesis 12? This is where that covenant began. Genesis 12, he said, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. Now, what a wonderful blessing. We just take that to the bank. I can sit back and enjoy that one for myself. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. This was their promise. This was, they were the nation. And they applied it as such in saying, we're different, we're better, we're chosen. Yeah. And yet they conveniently ignored the second half of God's promise to Abram. The second half of the verse says this, so that you will be a blessing. Because in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. So I want you to see right here from the very beginning that God's heart for people is not this dead-end blessing for a privileged few. But the divine workforce of his people embracing and extending the life-changing grace of Jesus, putting Jesus on display, moving toward people that we would otherwise want to sit and judge. And I know we can all relate to that. People we would otherwise just sit there and think about how bad they are and how much better we are than them, when in reality we're no better than anybody else. So Jesus calls sinners not to come out and stand above everyone like a Pharisee, but to go back in and become a fisher of men and reach more people. That's Abram's promise, that's Christ, that's the gospel. And this leads to the second observation that Jesus is the physician of the soul. And you see those verses right there. Those who are well have no need of a physician. Imagine for a second how silly it would be for you to make an appointment with your doctor and you go into the doctor and the doctor says, what's wrong? And you say, nothing. I just really like hanging out with you. What would the doctor say to you? Stop wasting my time. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess if you're willing to pay for it, we'll just sit here and talk for a while. And as silly as that sounds, that is often what church becomes if we're not thinking with the mind of Jesus. 
It becomes about, about gathering around ourselves people that make us feel good, that we're comfortable with. It's cloistering ourselves. It's, it's all of our decisions, whether it's sports or school or friends, revolves around keeping our family away from those people. And it is built on the faulty assumption, number one, that sin is out there, not in here. And that I am better than those people. I'm better than those people. And so I need to stay away from those people. We do it all the time. And I think that the danger in passages like this, when we get to the application point, what's the application? I think there's a danger in skipping right to the part where we say that we need to be more like Jesus and spend time with the sinners. That may be true. Maybe this morning you're sitting here thinking, I, I don't know anybody who's not a Christian. Well, that's, that's good. That's, that's challenging. I was challenged by that this week. I thought, oh my goodness. But the point that I am making is if that is where we go immediately, if we immediately identify with, with Jesus and say, oh, we just got to go save all of those sinners, the real gospel application, I believe, starts with this question as we move to close. With whom do you identify in this story? Just think about that for a second. You have Jesus. You have the Pharisees. You have the tax collectors. You have Levi. And I want to point out that obviously as Christians, we are identified with Jesus. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are righteous. We are saints. Why? Because of Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's all. But the point that I am making is if your thought first goes to Jesus, I identify with Jesus, I need to go save those poor sinners. Let me just say that is not the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that you and I are Levi. <laughs> you and I are the tax collectors. We are the outcasts. We are the undeserving. We are the ones who were sitting there in our occupation alongside the road and Jesus was passing by and had no reason to stop and look at you or me. But he did. <laughs> and that is the salvation story is that Jesus stopped and he looked at you and he looked at me and he said, you are worth it. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you do for a job or what the way you just spoke to your family. Like, I want you. And that is what salvation is. We are Levi. And I want to close with this story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18. Speaking of who we identify with. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and one was a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, there's his identity, he's separated, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. In other words, God, you should be thankful that you have me. Then verse 13, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but he beat his chest and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, who do you think went home that day justified before God? Who do you think went home that day a friend of Jesus? It wasn't the man who had his list of moral activities. It was the man who barely could look up and said, oh, Jesus, save me. And I want to just ask, friends, where are you this morning? Maybe to follow through on the question that we just asked and that's on the screen. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in the tax booth. People are walking by you. You've done a lot of things that you know are not right. And you think, I, I'm, I'm stuck. This is it. This is my job. And I just want to tell you today, Jesus is passing by and he's stopping right now. He's looking at you. He's saying, follow me. Maybe you feel like a Pharisee. Maybe you're realizing in this, these moments that you are really good at spotting the sins of other people. 
that you have your list of extortioners, and I'm, I'm, thank you, Lord, I'm not like that and like that and like that. And you realize, and I just want to say the same thing to you, the beauty of the gospel, Jesus is passing by. And he's looking at you, and he is stopping, and he's saying, follow me. Learn from me. Become like me. See, friends, we talk about embracing and extending at the church, right? But what is it we're embracing and extending? Say it. The life-changing grace of Jesus. What I want us to know and to believe and to feel and experience today is that this life-changing grace is no less radical than it was that moment when Jesus was sitting around the table with outcasts and sinners. The life-changing grace of Jesus is no less able to take people who are fishermen and lepers and paralytics and tax collectors and prostitutes and transform them from the lowest of sinners to the holiest of saints because of the grace of Jesus. And let me ask you today, do you want that today? Do you want Him? Do you need His grace? That is all that matters. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for sending your Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, to condemn sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Not because we have done all that we should have done this week, but because of your grace and your mercy. And we thank you, Jesus, that you did not pass by us. That you did not in the span, in the narrative of human history say, ah, they're not worth it. But you stopped and you came down and you looked us in the eye and you said our name and you reminded us that we have value to you because you made us. Lord, would you transform us? First of all, start with our own hearts. Lord, may we embrace this grace as that tax collector in the synagogue who just said, oh God, I'm a sinner. I have no reason to expect your kindness. But thank you for it. I embrace it. And that Lord, in that moment, when we identify with Levi, that we could truly identify with you. And that in that moment we would be used and increasingly so to be extending this transforming grace. Not just to our friends, not just to people who make us feel good, but to the lowliest of the world. The people that maybe up till this moment today we have been talking poorly about. May we move toward them the way you would move toward them. Jesus, we pray in your name for your glory and thank you. Amen.